Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a podcast about board games that was recently ranked one of the top 20 podcasts in Kingston about hobbyist board games, the under 60 category at under two hours per podcast. We're very proud of this. It's it's a big feather in our cap. And so how many nominations were there for that particular? It was fierce competition, but we managed to get to the top 20 of them. In, I, in Kingston. In Kingston. In, under in two the, hours. In the board game under, market. Look, those two dudes who are 70 years old who talk about games. That put out an episode every six months? Look, it's it's very popular. Okay. Anyway, I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me as always is my loyal co-host, Mike Walker. How you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. Very glad to hear it. Oh, uh, parenthetically, in addition to our getting on the top 20 of that list, we were also nominated for a Golden Geek Award. Fantastic, actually. Yeah, yeah. We're very pleased. We're very proud. We're very gratified that people went and nominated us for it. I'm very happy that her name is out there. That's what all I care about. Yes, and I look very much forward to getting trounced by one of the people there that has social media presences that dwarf ours by a factor of at least 10. Yeah, it's that's fine. But that, I, like I said, as long as her name is out there and even if, you know, 10, even if one person listens to the show that normally wouldn't because we got nominated, then it was... It was worth it. Oh, I just got a, I just got a text from Blue Peg Pink Peg, and they say, and I quote, "That's loser talk." End quote. Oof, that's that's rough. Yeah, those, that, guys, those guys are. I really shouldn't be buzz. In it, they're in it to win it. I should. I shouldn't be buzz marketing their podcast as a result. Anyway, so uh, we're going to be mixing things up this week. We're going to be talking about board games. We're going to talk about our as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, The Aurus. We're going to talk about games we played last week, the news and why it doesn't matter. Our feature game this week is Hate. Our topic is, this week is needing to know the deck. So with that in mind, let us launch into our Aurus. Walker, what did we review last year? It was Battle Lore. It is a two-player, giant fantasy battle-type small game. <laughs> I wonder why you characterize it as such. Well, because it, it that's why it's good. It can be whatever you want it to be. You know, you can use two maps. You can do this grandiose battle. You can use the troops that they were already give you in the box. Or you can, you know, take the time, craft your own army, give it all the flavor that you want. There's spells. There's different units. There's unit abilities. There's all sorts of interesting and fun stuff and battle lore is what you will make it and we still play it and we still love it. The fact that we've played it a couple times, uh, well I played it a couple times at least since we reviewed it last year, it's a testament despite the fact that it's now a almost a 6-year-old design and we don't have a lot of time for two-player games. The fact that we've gone to the effort to get it to the table is definitely a testament to its staying power. And I really do think that in, in terms of repeated plays, we haven't really seen much degeneracy, which is always good in big uh, asymmetric games like this. And I'm looking forward to the next Command & Colors game, which is coming out, which is Red Alert. Uh, Battle or 2nd Edition, which is what we primarily say, play. better caveat, 2nd Edition. Exactly, yeah. which had heavy, heavy design influence by Robert A. Kuba. It is probably the most different of all the Command & Colors games. All the other Command & Colors games are far more similar to each other than they are to Battle or 2nd, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to Red Alert, because it looks a little bit different from a lot of the standards of the Command & Colors games, although they do tend to get elaborated with expansions and stuff if, if, if they're successful. Anyway, we both love the system. Yeah, it's done by Fantasy Flight, and they did a great job on the figures and they put out a couple expansions even though the last one didn't get out i was waiting for that complaint ah well there you go hey look any game have... system without elves is a good game system as well, far as i'm concerned you know, it'd be nice to round out you know the the first all the factions from you know the base game would have been nice sure you have to concede though that even though there are only three different armies there's a lot of unit variety it's true yeah once you get all those expansions out. Anyway, it's out of print. It's a little bit hard to track down everything. But even the base game's got a tremendous amount of variety. And I think it's it's still a very, very worthy contender, especially in the sort of two-player uh, looks strategic, but in point of fact is tactical kind of deal. And if you like the command and color system, it's interestingly different, which is great. Yep. Now on to the games we played this week. Mark, what did you play this week? I get to play Root. I played with one of the new factions, namely the Underground Duchy. And Walker, I've got a quick multiple choice question for you. Was I able to play the Underground Duchy because A, we are so well respected in the industry that later games and Cole Worley personally reach out to us and say, we want your input. We care about what you have to say and think about these things. And we care deeply about your listeners. Or B, because I printed it off like every other pleb. Because you're a pleb. Yeah, I, I'm totally a pleb. Uh, just as a, as a minor side note, people sometimes ask us, you know, are we going to review X? Are we going to review Y? We don't get review copies. And 
there are good and bad reasons for that. But if you want us to review something and you think that a review copy would be helpful, contact the publisher. Don't contact us. We have no power. Anyway, so I got to play the Underground Duchy in Root. They were really cool. They, they reminded me a little bit of the Lizards. They reminded me a little bit also of some of the more straightforward military factions, like the Birds or the Cats, for those who are familiar with Root. And... Uh, they, they had these great combo special abilities that were very fragile. The moment they get hit upside the head, they start bleeding very, very badly. So they have to protect these buildings far more so than other factions. Lots of other factions need to protect their buildings, but the, the, the underground duchy really needs to protect their buildings. And that was an interesting balance. People thought that I was unstoppable until I reminded them, look, guys, this is what happens when I lose a building. And they're like, oh, OK. And, you know, a couple of conservative pushes later and I was kneecapped, not in a way that I couldn't recover. It was a very competitive game, but it was very much like all the other root factions. They seem unstoppable when they're playing to their strengths and you just have to know how to counter them properly. Anyway, we stand by uh, what we said about root. I'm looking forward to trying the next expansion faction, which I've got printed up and might try sometime this week, namely the Corvid Conspiracy. But... Even though this is uh, a first play with early components, I'm very, very pleased with this Root expansion content, and I'm looking forward to seeing what else is in the latest expansion, which is still up on Kickstarter as we speak. Not that they need your money, because they've got over a million bucks. So that was Root, specifically the Underground Duchy. I got Gugong back to the table and was proven wrong. We've always said that Jade is a is the losers, the losers game. And I explained to them that, there, that it was the loser's game, and one of the players decided that they were going to prove me wrong and do the jade, and then on side actions, make sure I didn't win. So that was maybe that is the jade <laughs> strategy, <laughs> is to get jade and then sabotage everybody else. Okay, I have an important question, though. Did they win the game? They did. Okay. Because if they prevent you from winning, then I don't care how well they do. That's already a triumph in itself. Well, there you go. What did they do that other Jade players didn't do? I'm curious. Because we've seen people make a push well, for Jade before. Well, we've talked about Jade. He just didn't He didn't completely focus just on Jade. I see. You know what I mean? And he got Jade when he wanted to, got Jade when it was cheap. And even the one, of the, the one uh, victory condition for Jade wasn't even out. And he still managed to maximize scores. They're all new players. So, and I did my usual uh, when playing against new players, you know, do something completely different. So maybe that was part of it as well. Who knows? But everyone had a wonderful time. Gugong usually hits home for everybody because it, it, I think it's still a solid game. I still enjoy it. It all sort of, you know, melds together and clicks together. There are a couple of of the advanced tiles that you put along the top, the the travel tiles that, well, one in particular, it's, it's the one where not only do you lose a point, but you give it to the other player. So it's a, it's a, it's a difference of two. And this is how he stopped me, right? Because he knew that this is, I was going to do this big thing at the end, cycle this thing a couple times, and then he put that on space, right? And now in a game where you usually finish around 30 points or so, a difference of two every time you hit it is so huge that it, it was just, it kneecapped me on the last turn. It was very interesting. I think I'll take those tiles out in future plays. Hmm. Good to hear him. That was Gugong. Got to play Blood Rage. Now I'd like to, I you know, I, I don't want to, make too many waves. I don't want to cause a stir. But, you know, as an uncontroversial opinion, I would like to advance the following opinion, Walker. Blood Rage is kind of fun. Hadn't played Blood Rage for a while, uh, so whipped it out with a bunch of people who'd already played before. And I was just reminded, uh, you once said, I think this was about a year ago, playing Blood Rage is like having a drink with an old friend or something to that, that, that extent. And it really is true. It's not that old of a design, but Everything is so clean, despite the fact that so many of the powers are crazy, which is a testament, I think, to the solidity of the design. And, of course, there are always you know, minor questions about how things work, but everything is, is very straightforward, and these are people that hadn't played in a very, very long time. I had a great time. Got to try something new. Got to try new powers. As always, when I play Blood Rage, I regret the fact that the drafting isn't as tight as it could be. You don't really get that interesting tension of taking something because you want it and taking something because you want to hate draft. And I, I always regret that. But playing again reminded me about how clever some of the other card flow issues are, namely the tempo about when a round is going to end. We had one of our rounds end very precipitously because somebody made a point to pillage as much as possible, and then suddenly the round was over, and I had a fistful of cards that I still wanted to play, but I always thought that I had time. I was just wrong. I, I was playing sloppily. Also, the issue of 
every time you are in a battle, you have to play a card face down. And whether it's a battle card or not, if you win the fight, the card goes away. And we saw some very powerful cards get stripped precisely because somebody started a fight they knew they couldn't win just because they wanted to deprive the card from somebody else. And, of course, on the back end, they were getting points for dead dudes, which is something that often happens in Blood Rage. Anyway... I always have a good time with Blood Rage. It wins a lot of friends. Very much like Ugong, it, it's very accessible, surprisingly so, given given the kind of place that it is in the market. So that was my recent experience with Blood Rage. I've got a small game of the Spiteful Seven or the Evil Seven or the Hateful Seven. Diefiesen, I think it's called in, in German. It's a fantastic card game. We brought it out because... Uh, Family was talking about a family game they played. It's some. It's an English game where you burn a cork and you have to recite, you know, the silly phrase like double double or something. And if you get it wrong, they put a dot on your head with the burnt cork. And then suddenly, when they refer to you, they have to say double double even longer. You know what I mean? And to the right or the left, it's the same sort of thing. You have to remember what you're saying. And you have to say it correctly or else you lose. Much like in The Hateful Seven, you're going around in a circle saying the number and the cards sort of manipulate how you're supposed to say it or not say it. And if you get it wrong, you get a bunch of cards. And everyone had a wonderful time. They saw, you know, the likeness and, you know, how it was like their family game. And and uh, everyone had a great time. So that was The Spiteful Seven. I got to play a number of very dry Euro games over the course of the week that were very, very, very fun. So I, I played for the first time a game called Kalamala. This was recommended by a listener, and I can't remember who. If it was you, please crawl, crawl out of the woodwork and get your just rewards, because Kalamala was very, very, very enjoyable. I had a very promising first experience with it. I'm looking forward to playing it some more. The theme is, wait for it, super exciting. Your cloth merchants in Italy Ooh. in the 17th century. Oh, I know, I know. Oh my God. It's amazing. Just a second. Palpitations. I know, I know. Just let me get my breath back. One yeah, second. yeah, calm down. It's got a very interesting action selection, which is not worker placement, and I haven't really seen it done the same way before. Basically, you put a token between two actions, and you do both actions on either side, and then the previous two people who went there also perform those two actions, and then if there's a fourth, that triggers scoring. So you have these little stacks that, that fluctuate. And there's some efficiencies to be considered and doing things inefficiently and setting yourself up for future turns and determining the tempo of the scoring. And the thing that I I really thought was going to appeal to me, which did very much appeal to me, the scoring is all area majority. And I love area majority. I don't play enough area majority games. I think it's a really good way to get substantive player interaction without unfortunate degeneracies. And that's basically it. There are a whole bunch of different kinds of area majority. You're putting cubes in various places and the timing of the scoring is super important. It it wasn't – nothing was stunningly original or immediately stuck out as something that was a, a tremendously cool hook other than the action selection mechanism, which was a little bit cute. But it was just the – the how nice the scoring was and how fierce the competition was and tempo trade-offs and all those lovely little details that Euro games often get right. And so that was my first experience with Kalamala. Looking forward to playing again. Looking forward to showing it to you, actually. Nice. Speaking of Euro games that get it right, we got Hansa Teutonica back to the table with people that played it before. And it just, it shines every time. It really is one of my favorite games of all time, just because the choices are there. Like, all of the decision-making, there's so many vital choices that you have to make. Even after you, you make the initial one, you know, where you complete the road, and then you have to decide, you know, what side you're going to do, if you're going to put guys in, if you're going to do the action, if you're going to clear your board. And they're all very important actions, and uh, Hansa Teutonica is a fantastic game. Play it. Base map? Base map, yeah. You played Hansa Teutonica and you didn't, you didn't tell me? I was at the convention. Oh. Suddenly I, I, I wish I'd gone to conventions. Got to play Amun Ray the card game again. Now, I'm a Reiner Knizia fanboy uh, right up there with everyone else, but there are uh, three elements of Reiner Knizia heresy that I have, namely three of his classics, that I regularly don't enjoy. One of them is Amun Ray. I'll spare the other two for, for future discussions. Amun Ray is, is an auction board game that it just has a number of things that uh, prevent me from getting engaged. One among them being you have to play with exactly five players, otherwise the, the, the game's a little too loose. The card game, which is generally not very well appreciated, it was released a couple of years ago, I actually think is, is better than the board game. I find it much more compelling. Uh, I like the trade-offs a lot more. It's got a number of cute elements to the auctions, uh, some of which are actually kind of borrowed from Raw, namely the inability to make change. And I like auctions with that little bit of restriction in terms of how you can do things. There was something in Amun Ray about 
it was this increasing scale. You bid in triangular numbers, but the the, the inability to make change, I think, works uh, works to, to to get a similar attention. And it was really good. I played with uh, a, a bunch of new players, and we're going to talk a little bit later about the experience of playing auction games with new players in our topic. But the just the the, the money trade offs and the layers of the auctions about what to do was really really good. Now, however, all that having been said. You know, small small footprint, easy to teach, easy to play. Uh, I have now, having played I'm going to write the card game three or four times, it does have a little bit of a runaway leader problem because of the way scoring works. Your primary points income is going to be through pyramids, and if you generate a strong first couple rounds, there's not really much of anything that someone can do to hobble you for the third round unless you're very, very stupid with your money. You can spend yourself into a hole in I'm going to write the card game, and maybe you got that point lead by spending yourself into a hole, but if you haven't done that, then you're, you've probably got it. It, which is a little unfortunate, you know, kind of saps the tension near the end. But other than that, I have a great time with I'm going to the card game. On the topic of classic Euros, got to play Agricola. This was the first time I played Agricola in a very long time. And this was with other people who had not played Agricola in a very long time and were very much looking forward to it. And honestly, it was very nostalgic in a very specific set of ways. Number one, I remember a couple of things about Agricola when it was released more than 10 years ago that really presage a lot of modern Euro games. I remember... When it was released in 2007, people said, as a knock against it, that it had a lot of components, a lot of different things to move around and and go around. And honestly, compared to your average modern Euro, even one that's much lighter, it doesn't feel like there's much stuff in it at all. I'm not saying that there's a paucity of stuff in the box. I'm just saying that, you know, in terms of manipulating the components, it's not particularly problematic or particularly overstuffed. Another thing that I remember, this is just a very minor detail. I remember when it was first released, they said, ooh, it's got custom meeples shaped like animals. Fancy that. And now every Euro game, whether it's a Kickstarter or not, has custom molded components. Welcome to Kickstarter. Exactly. It's so weird. What was especially strange was, as I remember, you only got the custom meeples during the very first printing of Agricola if you had ordered the uh, pre-ordered the Essence set or pre-ordered from the publisher. For a long time, for a couple of years actually, the published versions only had cubes for the animals and no custom components at all. And then... Very quickly thereafter, third-party publishers and even originally the the original publisher made kits so you could upgrade the wood and the stone and everything, custom-molded components. It was one of the first euros to do that. And now it's just standard. It's you know part of the industry standard. If you just have cubes to represent everything, like, for example, Kalamala does, that's kind of the exception rather than the rule. Anyhow, had a great time playing Agricola. The way that it forces you into these bottlenecks, it has these very, very staged production bottlenecks about... First, you have to generate a, a, a reliable way to feed your family, and then you have to worry about expanding your house, and then you have to expand your children. As one of the early Euro, game, Euro worker placement games, you do have to worry about getting more workers. That is the dominant strategy in the sense that everyone needs to do it to stay competitive. And I, I, all things being equal, I wish it didn't do that. But all of that having been said, Agricola is still one of my very favorite worker placement games. It's probably still my favorite Uwe Rosenberg game. And I just, I just love seeing the different professions come out and all the different modifications and all the cards. We drafted at the start of the game because, again, these were people who'd all played Agricola before, so we drafted our initial occupations and minor improvements. It was so nice to get it out. I also got to play with uh, a farm board that represented Mars, so it was also the best game of Terraforming Mars that I've I'd oh, ever played, you go. which was very, very nice. And then finally, got to play Hanabi which is an Antoine Boza cooperative game where you're not allowed to speak to anybody. So it was great to sit down and nobody got to deal with my annoying voice. I really like Hanabi. I especially like it in the deluxe version where you don't have to hold your cards. This is a co-op game where you don't get to see your hand. Everyone else does, but they can only clue you in very, very specific ways. Have you played Hanabi before? I have not, but it made me think we should do a Hanabi-themed podcast one time. Yeah, we should totally do a live play of Hanabi. Anyhow, good time. Uh, we didn't score very well. Hanabi is a game where you don't often lose. I hear people tell, and if you're one of these people, uh, I, I would love to hear from you, actually. Some people talk about how Hanabi is very easy and they get to 25 all the time. And I, another thing that I hear from Hanabi players is they talk about how they play and it's clear that they cheat and they cheat rampantly. Because the game doesn't let you set up conventions. You don't get to have have a 15-minute discussion before the start of the game about what various gestures and actions mean to everybody else. This is a thing that you're supposed to infer from the clue. There's not a 25-book set like there is in Bridge about how you need to give tells about your cards? Yeah, precisely. There's a mechanism for communicating with the other players, and that's built into the game. And so I'm always amazed when people say, oh, it's easy to get to 25, and then you start poking them about how they play, and it's clear that they're basically cheating. 
Anyhow, that's another discussion for another day. Uh, please send all your hate mail to aircanada.ca. And I really like Antoine Boza as a designer. He does lots of interesting stuff. His most famous game is Seven Wonders, and we don't like Seven Wonders. But he's done Ghost Stories. He's done Hanabi. He's done a lot uh, Takedo and lots of other weird and interesting things. So he's definitely one of those designers that I always look for. Hanabi is probably one of my favorite of his designs. I really like it as a co-op design, and it's a great co-op to pull out for people who don't like co-ops for various communication reasons because it doesn't have those problems. It can be a little random, can be a little unforgiving, but I like hard co-ops even if they're hard in part because of some random unforgiving stuff. So that was Hanabi. Well, that's a great segue into the news. And why it doesn't matter. Oh, but I wanted to talk about Antoine Boza on the news. No, I have it here first. New okay, ver- well, okay, fine, ver- fine. Go ahead. New version of Ghost Stories. Is that what you have? Yes. By Repost Productions. So that seems kind of interesting because it is a little bit of an older design. And I think it could uh, really do well with a little bit more streamlining and making it actually possible to win would be nice as well. So that... Oh, come on. <laughs> I Look, I've won Ghost Stories on occasion, and we like hard co-ops. Why are you, know, why are you slagging know. you for that? Just because that's what it's well known for. That's all. Sure. So the new version is going to be called Last Hope. It's going to have a different theme. Don't know about that yet. I actually quite liked the uh, – the, it, was, it was a little bit different. Last Hope is supposed to be sort of a European medieval fantasy thing, which could be very, very, very generic. That's always the problem. Ghost stories, I agree, could be a little could do with a little bit of streamlining because there are a lot of niggling corner rules questions. I don't think the difficulty needs to be changed at all. Another thing that he's going to be redeveloping is uh, Takedo. He's going to be doing a new version called Nimiji, which is apparently going to be very similar to Takedo, where again you're traveling along a road and stuff is happening. I never really liked Takedo, uh, but maybe Nimiji will be exactly the same, and thus I won't have any reason to try that either. So that's some new stuff coming from Antoine Boza in the coming year. Some other news is. As as most D in their quest to control everything will now be distri- distributing Simon games, so you know they now have the second biggest company also now under their wing, sort of. So kind of. So this yeah, is... well, Simon will be doing all their Kickstarter stuff, you know, yes, and putting out that shipping that out all by themselves. But anything that's left over extra that they're going to sell will now be put out by. Well, not even just their leftovers. All their nor- so first of all, some of their products never true. are kickstarted and go out through normal retail distribution anyway. That's true. Whether it's Ethno, Sway of the Panda, lots of other Zombicide stuff, you know. Uh, but I, I'm not exactly sure how this is going to affect Canadians because, as we've talked about before on the show, we've talked, we've heard from a number of different retailers complaining about the ability to get Fantasy Flight stock. That's right. On the reg now, Simon doesn't have any sort of. LCG type formats where they need constant restocking of waves of expansion material in the same way that you would if you were stocking X-Wing or Armada or any of those kinds of things. But this could be bad news for some Canadian retailers, which I'm sure is of no consequence to you heartless Americans. Next in the news, that was mine. You okay. It's your turn. Do you not have anything else? I do. Or did you want me to like some sort of like bash them some more? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> for like a, a, a death blow. No, no, that, that was sufficient bashing. Okay. So first of all, just as a minor side note, uh, USAopoly has renamed themselves to The OP. I don't know if this is just an homage to uh, that great show, The OC, of 10 years ago, but that's what they call themselves now. And they're going to be releasing a diehard game called Nakatomi Heist. Now, <laughs> hey, I saw this on, on the hotness list, and I, I clicked on it, and I was looking at some of the pi- – People love diehard. Pictures. It looks like it might be interesting. People love Die Hard. Here's the problem that I have with it right away, though. And this is sort of a corollary or a footnote to our previous discussion about one versus all games. This is a one versus all game in which one player plays as John McClane and everybody else, one to three other players, based on the player count of the game, play as various insurgents and bad guys against John McClane. Now, here's the question. If you're going to be playing a Die Hard game, Basically, at rank one of who you want to be is John McClane. Then you go down a few steps for most people, and then there's Hans Gruber. Maybe you might like Hans Gruber more than John McClane, but that's probably due to views on various actors rather than actually, you know, the, the nature of Hans Gruber. And then there's about 50 million ranks before you hit anybody else. It's like, oh, that dude that Bruce Willis killed in Act 1, or that dude that Bruce Willis killed in Act 1, or that dude that Bruce Willis killed in Act 2. Like, what, what else is there? And so if you're going to be doing a licensed property, 
this seems like one of those things that doesn't really fit. I talked about this before when we when when I said, look, the, the setup should really match uh, a themed design. The same th- same thing is true of the, the various Bloodborne games. Uh, well, the one that came out and the one that's in development now, it doesn't really suit itself to a co- competitive experience. No, it's a great two player game. Sure. Uh, anyway, so so that's uh, that's Die Hard Nakatomi Heist. Seems like a strange 1v all candidate, but there you go. I've got a game coming out from Renegade Games that I really like the art for. I have no idea what the game is going to be like. I'm going to look into the rules because I hope that there's a game there because the art is amazing. It's called Aquacorn Cove, and it's coming out, like I said, by Renegade Games. Check out the art. If that's the kind of thing you like, then uh, I'm looking forward to giving it a try. Apparently it's based on the book. Are you at all familiar with the book? Not at all. There's a fantastic game called Fuji Koro that also looks amazing. It looks like it's some sort of area majority, Euro, tons of plastic, all, you know, you know, a bunch of samurai go out, collect artifacts. It looks like it's going to be fantastic. That's Fuji Koro from Game Brewer, the same company that put out uh, Gugong. So I'm looking for, I'm thinking the production is going to be good. It's a deluxe version. So I'm hoping all the components are going to be as good or even better than... Uh, then Gugong, and maybe there'll be game trays. Oh, one can, only, one can only hope. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. On to our feature game, which is Hurt. So this was designed by Raphael Guitton, Jean-Baptiste Lillier, Alexandre Oltiano, and Nicolas Raoult. These are, so there's, there's some design pedigree uh, behind these guys. Uh, three of them, namely all of them except for uh, Mr. Oltianu, uh, designed Zombicide and Massive Darkness. So definitely under the aegis of Culminar, not cute but stupid, if that's your particular flavor of cute but stupid. And two of them, namely Jean-Baptiste Lullier and Nicolas Raoult, were also members of the Rackham design team. So they put out things like Confrontation, like AT43, uh, a number of other very, very, very cool and uh, nostalgia-inducing, certainly for me, uh, French miniatures game products that were always extremely lovely and detailed and uh, sometimes were fun to play too. Not always. But so these four designed uh, <clears throat> hate. I guess we should just say it normally. Uh, we have to say yeah, it normally yeah. eventually. But I, oh, I thought you were knocking and design the design part. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, I'll be getting to that later. Absolutely in detail. So this is a uh, skirmishy type game with a campaign element, and Walker is going to give us an extremely unhelpful characterization of how one plays hate. All right. So in hate, you're going to flesh set your flesh furnace to about 500 because you <laughs> want that extra nice char flavor. Plus, you want it that high because you want the bones to crack to get at that good, good marrow. So you cook at about five minutes, and you want to eat immediately because that smell just attracted another tribe, and they're already... Oh, wait. You're dead. (laughs) (laughs) That is hate. Eating humans and dying. (laughs) All right. Okay. So what really hate really is, (laughs) is yet another... Dice pooling game from Simon. It's a two player uh, miniature game where you collect your tribe together, you set up the train, uh, you pick a scenario card, and it tells you how to set up the train, how to set up your figures. Sometimes they might start in combat right away, sometimes you might have to run up a hill, and then you, uh, you each take turns back and forth. You get to activate two guys, maybe three, and uh, you run up. And you determine how many dice you're going to get. You roll to see how many successes you get. Your opponent rolls his vents, tries to block those hits. And it has an, uh, a p- part where you're paying a currency to activate these guys and activate abilities. And you might run it. And the turn ends when you either A, run out of this currency that you used to activate guys, or B, you've activated your whole team. And the turn, the game's going to end for four, uh, last for four turns or unless the scenario objective is met. And that's hate. So this is a skirmish game with a campaign element baked in, no pun intended, with respect to baking. And uh, maybe we should do a recipe show. Yes. Uh, c- cook- cooking with hate. Mm. Cooking for people you hate and with people you hate. So I have endless patience for skirmish games, even the dumb ones. And to my mind, there are three big problems that, miniatures ga- that, that skirmishy type miniatures games often have. And I just want to quickly give a, a, a summary about where I'm coming from in terms of my priorities for skirmish-type games. Number one, does maneuver matter? Are you just running your attacker to a target and then rolling dice? And I will say, to its credit, in hate, the support system is kind of clever. 
You have a number of figures that can add support on attack, but never on defense. So that's the bias in favor of the attacker, which is another good thing for, for skirmishy type games to have. And you're encouraged to make tactical little scrums to make sure that your attacks can be of maximal effectiveness. So that, that's covered. You, you, you care where your people are. A lot of skirmish games fail right away because it doesn't really matter where anyone is. You just scrum towards the middle and that's that. The second thing that games like this often fail at, and this is true even of very, very good ones like Heroescape, do ranged attacks work in concert with melee attacks? Is the balance okay? In Heroescape, range is just too good. Melee characters desperately need some sort of boost in order to, to, to be competitive. And Hate, to its credit, and this is a design trend that I really, really like, has almost no ranged combat. And when ranged combat exists, there are no line of sight rules. So it's very simple, relatively rare, and not particularly strong. So that's great. And then there's the last bugbear of games like this often, and that is, is the scenario design any good? And that's where I'll start with where I think things fall apart with Hate. The scenarios in Hate are terrible. They're not all terrible, but most of them are pretty terrible. In that, they don't seem very fun for both sides, they certainly don't seem very balanced, and sometimes they don't even seem to have been written properly. They have little nested rules, ambiguities, and subsystems built into the scenario that immediately leads to a whole bunch of questions about how they work. Uh, so that's my sort of bird's eye view of, of, of some of the I- important things in, in skirmish games. There are some other things unique to hate uh, that we will absolutely talk about. But my sort of summary right off the bat, and I'm going to let Walker talk in just a second here, but I'm going to draw out this moment, is that for every clever thing that hate does, it does two things that are dumb. And as a result, I wish that some of the cleverer bits had either been in a different kind of design or if they hadn't quite been saddled with other these dumb bits. And the first thing I'll flag right away is, again, the scenarios. Yeah, either the map is printed wrong or, like you said, they have to, like, surge up this hill and hills are ridiculously powerful. And so you can just get to the edge of it and then you're going to get beaten back and killed. And then you run up your next guy's drag up the hill. Anyway, let's move on from that. I'm just going to go over some neutral points that I don't find that are either good nor bad, but they are what they are. I.e. everyone move the, they have a lot of things that are the same for everybody. So you're not endlessly looking up stats and stuff. I.e. everyone moves the same. There are no weapon stats. There's no fancy weapons or anything you have to look up. Everyone just has an attack stat. Every tribe has the exact same number of figures, so you don't have to be, you know, trying to figure out how many you're going to go against. And the unit setup is printed on the scenario. So there's no, like, you know, figuring out where you want to put your guys. Everyone's put on. And like I said, in the, the, the scenarios that seem to work, everyone is in combat immediately. Agreed 100%. And some of that is really good. The, 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 when it works, when everything is working, hate is pretty good. It definitely falls into the cute but stupid with a couple of clever bits when everything works. One of the things I'd just like to touch on, you're right that the setup is great in that it is all printed out of the scenario and you don't have to worry about boring deployment phases because deployment phases can often be very, very dull. The components. I normally don't complain about usability problems. There are lots of games with minor usability problems and people complain about them endlessly and I don't really mind or care. Hate's usability problems are huge. First of all, the different fighters are differentiated by colored base. And the colored bases for the warriors, you have pale blue, you have darker blue, and you've got purple. And I've never had color differentiation problems like I've had with hate. The green ones are even worse. There's light green, dark green, and puke green. And I have to look and correspond with the number in order to set them up properly. And then when I'm actually activating them, you're supposed to leave a token representing savagery, which is the currency of the game. Not sexual tension is previously recorded. We apologize for the error. Retractions will be sent in writing to cool many or not. And you're supposed to put them on the figure, but there's not enough room on the base on any of them, really, except for maybe the prince, which is the biggest figure. And so we've tried a couple of different workarounds just to see what's going on. And we've got a couple that kind of sort of work, but they don't quite work. And on top of this is the continuing problem of making sure that you can correspond a card with a figure on the map. And this is hard. I'm going to say, I just want to put in why you need to do this. One, when your opponent looks at the board, they want to see all of the figures you've activated, right? So that way you have to mark them somehow. And when you act, once you've played a few games, when you activate it, figure, you want to make sure you're getting their stats right. Because A, they could have more attacks, less attacks, more move, less move. So you want to make sure A, you're activating the right character, and B, your opponent knows exactly who who you've activated. This kind of dovetails with my general opinions about the components of hate. 
setting the aesthetic aside, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the components are sometimes well executed in the aggregate. Like you set up a board of hate, especially with some of the add-on terrain and trees and, and huts like Walker or Sprung for, and it all looks very impressive. The overall scope and sweep is very nice and it's quick to set up. The problem is once you start boring down into the small details, like the physical act of activating a unit, corresponding that unit to the card, putting the token on the unit, moving it around, making sure you don't displace things, dislodge the tokens that are on the board, etc., etc., etc. Honestly, never have I wanted. A lot of people, they look at minis games and they say, the miniatures ruined the game, I wish that, I wish there were tokens instead. I have never been one of those people except for hate. Because if you had tokens instead, you could just print a number right on top of that thing. You'd have no problem corresponding with, with the card. And you'd have no problem putting tokens to indicate that they've already been activated. With tokens, hate would be infinitely more usable. Exactly. That's why I have this under bad t- counters, tokens, and chits everywhere. You have the trees that you have hands all over. Whenever you take a KO figure, you get hate tokens. You have your activation tokens that are sprawled all over the thing. You have chits to mark the... The innocence chits to mark the huts. There's tons of stuff, and it's some. It's over the top. I don't mind the tons of stuff. I just wish it were more usable. Yes. And besides, this isn't a game like you know Twilight Imperium or Eclipse where there's an additional length to the gameplay well, that, well, that would warrant it. Well, that, it's quick and dirty. That's what I'm saying. You know, based on the, how basic the rules are and what it's supposed to be doing, it's supposed to be this quick, fast, hard two-player skirmish game. There's a lot of fiddly bits and 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 messing around with components. Can we talk about the aesthetic for a bit? I have that under good points. I really, Go ahead. I really like the setting, right? I know you've said that all the figures look the same, and, 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 and I agree with you. They do all look the same, but I think it fits into the theme, right? It's post-apocalyptic, and, you know, everyone's just wearing skins, and I think it would be hard maybe to make every unit look different. I'm not sure without, you know, falling into, like, maybe uh, uh, racial tropes or, or, or country tropes, you know, and making them look different that way. I think I like I like the way it looks. So there's the lizard people that you're playing with. Yes. And when you pay attention to the details, like, oh, that guy's got weird feet. He's a lizard guy. Okay, fine. And then there are some with big, cool tails. That's fine. But even amongst the tribe of the lizard people, most of them, to me, look like generic barbarian hard cases. Then there are the plant people, which, again, some of them look very obviously possessed by plant and, and other nature spirits and so forth. And sometimes you bear down on the details like, oh, there's some roots crawling out over there. But much of the time, they just look like barbarian hard cases. And then there's about six tribes that are all just barbarian hard cases. And honestly, I have a great deal of difficulty visually differentiating any of them. And I think that this leads to a general sense of fatigue on the part of, the, on the part of a user like me. Again, in aggregate. The visual appeal is considerable, but when you bear down on the details, it's just so much of the same. And look, I we made fun of the campaign announcement video, and we specifically said that it felt like they were trying too hard. You know, using expletives in a way that was clear that they were not comfortable with using expletives. And honestly, the final product doesn't rub me the wrong way that way. I think it overall, it's it's relatively well done, and there's some profanity in the rule book, but it's fine. It's you know, it sounds like how people would talk. And your resource markers are severed hands. You know, whatever. I, I it it. it It's fine. It's just there are missed opportunities here. You don't have to resort to racial or ethnic tropes. You could just have different varieties of mutants. You could have sufficient visual flair. You know, you could have a a tribe with extra limbs. They believe in body modification in some way. You can have other mutant animal tribes rather than just the lizard men. That's just two ideas off the top of my head, and I am not a creative person. When it comes to post-apocalyptic mutant wasteland, there's no shortage of ideas. Now, yes, this is an adaptation of an Adrian Smith graphic novel. Absolutely. I'm not necessarily blaming Simon at the development stage. I'm just saying that the end result is very, very well executed visually, but not very usable and not particularly visually interesting. True. This is with the miniatures, but I think in gameplay they did do a fairly good job at making them all different. Because not only does every tribe have their own tribe deck that you're going to draw two cards every turn, and they all give uh, unique abilities and theme to each uh tribe but they also have their upgrade cards are different for every tribe as well and they all that also usually ties into the cards and and does a fairly good job at making every tribe different and unique in its own way i honestly love the cards the cards are my favorite part of the game in hate every every tribe has its own very small deck of cards and you just pull two at the top of every round and if you haven't used them by the end of the round they're gone 
and I saw lots of lovely little detail flourishes in some of the card activations. For example, the card that's incredibly expensive and lets you do a bunch of activations all at once that gets cheaper as the game goes on. Or a card that only works at a certain point, but you can pay extra to hold it on from round to round. Or cards with variable effects or variable costs, and they really served to do what the visuals didn't, namely give a sense of personality to some of the tribe. And they got a lot of mileage out of a very small number of cards. I absolutely agree. But I don't think that we can talk about the upgrade system without talking about the campaign system as a whole. Because I agree with you that the upgrades give a certain amount of flavor, and they serve to dis- differentiate the warriors. The first thing I will note, though, just to, just to, as a bit, I agree with you that one of the strengths of hate is that when it being simple and straightforward and clean, and the more details you load into the individual warriors, you start undermining that core strength, especially given, again, how hard it is to figure out who's doing what and where. But let's talk about the campaign system. What are, what are your thoughts about the campaign system and the upgrades therein? I do like it. I like it. It's fairly basic. They give you a map and, you know, there's stuff on the back that you can keep track of. And it's just, you know, pick one, pick a territory that you're adjacent to and you're fighting there. And it gives you some sort of, you know, benefit uh, in future battles if you win. And it's sort of this back and forth. And they kept it, you know, fairly basic. So I really like the campaign. It gives you this feeling of an overall system and gives you a little uh, a reason to win. <clears throat> okay. So the first time we played... We initially had a few moments of confusion where we had actually mixed up the Scar deck and the Upgrade deck. And all these people that were getting Scarred were getting little be- uh, little bonuses. All these Fallen Warriors, especially from the losing team, because the first scenario we had, the losing team had a lot of casualties because that was just the victory condition. And then I was very keen to see where the campaign was going to go because one of my problems with campaign games like this is there's often a very strong rich-get-richer dynamic. And the one where the the, the the tribe that took the most losses in so doing giving the win and resources to the victors, where they got stronger because they got beaten down, again, being post-apocalyptic barbarian hard cases, I was enthusiastic and I wanted to see what was going on. Then we found out that we'd been doing it wrong. We swapped it and then we started actually giving people scars. And then my enthusiasm dampered considerably. They're not terrible. Getting scarred and the, the, the consequence of losing are not awful, but it just feeds into this overall rich get richer problem. We're in a situation now in, in, in one of the campaigns where we're only a few games in, but one side has all these banked advantages that trigger every fight that are now huge. And there is no realistic basis to assume that the people on the losing end of this curve can recover. There's nothing built in. There's no rubber banding, which might have been its own problems, but there's nothing to compensate for that. And as a result, it's just this death spiral that's apt to continue. The winners get more resources. They get more stuff. They get more upgrades. They get more... Uh, in, in-game in resources. They get uh, uh, elaborated buildings, which get you trigger special abilities both in and outside the fight. And their territories, every time they win a territory, they just get more and more stuff. And that's fine. You're right, it absolutely gives a sense of consequence and heft to the game. But I don't think... That it, that it is superior to an alternate skirmish game where the asymmetry is built in right, right up the top. Because there, when there are balance issues, at least they're evident right from the start, and it's just for a one-off. Here, we're talking about unbalanced scenarios with random effects and all the possibility of crippling scars and the, abil- the, the possibility of incredible upgrades, all of which, of course, are doled out semi-randomly. But once you get a couple wins under your belt, it just seems like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Agreed. You covered a couple points. Like I, I have here, snowballing. It seems as though the winner is going to keep winning. I just want to go over how these cards actually work. Sure. Is that every tribe has uh, 11 cards because you have 11 warriors. Lay them out in front of you and it has all of their stats on it. So when you win or lose a match, you're going to get either scars or benefits and you slide them into these sleeves and these opaque things go across much like Mystic Veil or these other games that have opaque cards and you're going to get bonuses or bad things. And if you ever get two scars, you die could be a, a bad thing because it's a, on this random chart so it's this, yet this other weird random thing which we're going to go into the combat i'm sure we're going to go to the combat later where it's like random attack versus random defense but this is yet another random thing that's going to happen at some tribes might not lose anybody and never get any scars because they've rolled great and everyone else and other teams are going to lose all their guys and not get any upgraded guys so so i, it, I love the fact that you know we you're going to lose guys quickly and they come back immediately and sometimes you're going to get tribe-specific upgrades if you've got the right building out, so that part is great. But other than that, sometimes it can be rough. So let's talk about the battle resolution then. 
It is quick and dirty, and that's great. It's not like a five-step resolution mechanism. And sometimes you have cool trade-offs. You know, the attacker resolves the attack first, and you get wild results, which could either give you more savagery, which is in-game currency, or can be turned into hits. And then you have to decide, how badly do I want this attack to succeed? How likely do I think it is given the attack? That part is great. That part I really like. And then the defender has the built-in advantage of already knowing what they need to get to in order to successfully defend, so they have that advantage. So that's that's the minor compensation for the defender. They tend to generate more of a currency simply because they know how many defense results they need. So every time you roll wilds, that happens. That part is clever. That part I like. And in those situations, whereas the attacker, you have to make those trade-offs, it's great. Balanced against that, though, is that I'm increasingly of the opinion, this is a gross generalization, but I, so far it's, it's been relatively accurate, I much prefer attack systems where it's just the attacker rolling, or just the defender, whatever. Like, for example, in level 7 Omega Protocol, or Claustrophobia, where it's just, here's your target value, roll, see how many hits you do. I tend to prefer that because it's a little bit of a smoother probability curve, and it tends to limit the number of truly crazy repeated results you tend to see. Yeah, which we did see, right? Yes. Where it's like continuously defended or continuously not defended, and one side just snowballing the other, and it was it was pretty rough, some of these games. Yeah, especially since, unlike some other dice systems, again, to compare to other games that I think have, have, have surmounted this problem successfully, in a game like Street Masters, there are no bad results. There are worse results and results you're looking for less. You know, when you're attacking, you don't want to roll all defense results, but... That gives you some compensation. You get these defense tokens that you can use later. In hate, there are strictly bad results. If you're attacking, you don't want shields. And if you're defending, you don't want attack symbols. The other ones are good, again, especially when they're trade-offs. But given that, again, it feeds into this this, this wild, slightly more wild probability curve and, and leading to unusual situations. And it can lead sometimes to negative player experiences. We're talking about a relatively low roll density game. And so unusual results can predominate. And that's a bit frustrating. And I prefer it when there are games that have a little bit more sophistication in them so you don't have to worry about that to the same extent. So last few bad points I have here that we didn't talk about was the fact there might not be enough scars. If you roll a scar and it's not in the deck, then you don't even have to take it. And we were only played with two people and we were already running out of scars, so that seemed odd. And then the fact... And we talked about the rules being bad already. And it seems though when yet one of these other problems, when there's more Kickstarter extras thrown at the last minute, they seem to conflict with some of the rules and just bring up more questions rather than make things move smooth like they should. Yeah, we've had a number of persistent rules questions about su- either subsystems or scenario-specific rules or how scars work or specific special abilities work, and the fact is laughably insufficient. It doesn't seem to address any of the things. It's never had the answer to what we were looking for, and it often seems to address things that seem transparently obvious. In a game that's relatively simple, I'm actually surprised at the number of persistent rules difficulties where we've just had to make a decision on the fly yeah. to keep going when it, when it yeah. comes to hate. This makes more sense. And then we already talked about the fact that we gave all of our warriors an upgrade as opposed to a scar because they used exactly the same symbol system on both the cards, like you know, yeah. A1 or A2 scar or A1 or A2 benefit. Like you have a very large alphabet or something else, even though they There's did, only three letters in the alphabet. They, they did they say... They ran out of letters. The scars do say scars on them, but if you're new to the game or you know, you're, you've put all the decks together or for whatever reason, it's, it would have been quite easy just to use a different letter or something else. A letter know. after D? I just, I know it's crazy talk, but I think they could have done it. I think... I'm looking down at a keyboard now. There seems to be these other letters. I don't know what they're used for, (laughs) but I'm sure they could have used these things here. So I really like some of the bits. I like the tribe-specific cards. I also like the forge, which we didn't talk about, which is where you can pay currency to activate special abilities to reactivate people, get extra dice. That part was nice. I liked that bit. And I really want to like the components, but I can't really because, again, I just get this sort of uh, homogeneous sort of wash of badassery that doesn't really appeal to me visually. I, I wanted a little bit more differentiation. And ultimately, I think the campaign system is to its detriment. When you're playing with reasonably balanced forces in a reasonably balanced scenario, which admittedly is seldom, and the rules get out of your way, hate is good for some cheap thrills. I say cheap in a general sense, not discount, you know, discounting the fact that it's a relatively expensive product. And I have a lot of enthusiasm for, for, for skirmishy type games. But given everything that's involved here, I would infinitely rather play something like Akko, like Titan's Tactics, like any of the, 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 the billion other skirmishy type things, whether it's co-op or competitive, that's available that doesn't have these sorts of baggages. Because again, 
usability issues alone take me out of the experience far off, far more often than it should. Sure. I'm just, I, I don't think it learned any lessons from its predecessors, i.e. I. Necromunda. It gives you that Necromunda feel about your advancing your guys forward. It's cool. They get abilities. You know, depending on how well they do, they're going to get they're going to get cooler. Having your guys get cooler is always fun. It's the Pokemon syndrome all over again. But in Necromunda, you have a rating for your gang. If they'd just done a tribe rating, whereas the person with the lower rating gets to pick the scenario and pick if they want to be the attacker or the defender, exactly like Necromunda does, then it would bypass all of these problems, like, easily. And that's my sum up of hate. I will, I definitely want to keep playing it. I do enjoy playing it. I, I'm looking forward to playing it with, you know, more more feeling in the game, more at stake, as opposed to just, you know, playing it to experience it. And that is Hate. By Simon Games and Eric Lang. <laughs> <laughs> he was nearby when it yeah, was being developed. Right. He, was, so, he, was, so he was in the office. Yeah. And I'm sure, I think he walked by and looked in the room once, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So our topic this week is needing to know the deck. Now, I suggested this on the basis that there's a certain kind of game where the composition of a set of random elements that you might be drawing from is very, very consequential to the decisions you'll be making and to your success or failure in the game. And there's a very particular kind of sensation in these designs that I just wanted to tease out a little bit about how it feels to play these games, how it feels to not know the deck composition, how it feels to play against people that do. Uh, and so do you have any games you want to start talking about this? Well, I want to talk about a lot of GMT games fall into this category and, and uh, up front would be Twilight Struggle. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about up front, which is not a GMT I game, but... <laughs> I know, that's but no, in Twilight Struggle, you really know, need to know what cards are going to come up, not only in your deck, but you also need to know what cards are going to come up in your enemy's deck, and you have to be able to prepare for these and, and know what's going to happen, or else you're going to have a not and not a fun time and and lose. Yeah, Twilight Struggle is an interesting category for me. So I've divvied up games in a, into a number of categories where you might need to know the deck. In Twilight Struggle, there's two categories of cards where you should, ideally, you'd want to know where they are and what, what 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 they're apt to do. First, you have your scoring cards. You absolutely need to know, before playing Twilight Struggle for the first time, which regions are going to score when. You know, you need to know that Europe is in the Era 1 score... Is, the Europe scoring is in the Era 1 deck, but South America is in Era 2. So Europe is going to score in your first few rounds, but South America is less apt to. Things like that. That you absolutely need to know, and you need to be able to show somebody the player aid and say, okay, look, here are the regions that are going to score. Then there's a whole bunch of other cards where, again, experience and or a lot of historical knowledge can really work in your favor. So you don't want to go into Cuba if you're the Americans before Castro comes out, because ca the effect of the Castro card just says America gets kicked out and the Soviets get control. The same is true of Egypt, the same is true of Romania, the same is true of a bunch of other cards. As far as Cuba is concerned, you know, a historical heuristic can get you pretty far. Romanian abdication? Mm, Maybe less so. And maybe you should tell a new player to scan the player aid and infer what those do, but I think that's a little unreasonable. It's like, oh, there's, it says here there's a card called Nasser, so clearly as the Americans I should know not to go into Egypt very hard uh, outset. I think that's a little bit un unreasonable. But as I say, you can at least flag the scoring cards. True. Well, this is some of my points that I want to bring up is that it's with, with games like this where you need to know the deck, that's very hard to bring in new players. Yes. And that this what we're talking about right now caveats into this other point where even if you explain some of these problematic cards, they have no context. They have no idea how, you know, this works in the game and they have nothing to base it on or, you know, examples. So it's even harder to show them why these cards are important, right? So this is another reason why I, these games can be very difficult. It's true. Your first game is often a wash. And this actually raises an interesting issue. It's strange what we are willing to value and what we're willing to prioritize as gamers as skills in a game. So, for example, there's a related issue, which is another topic which we may talk about in the future, hidden trackable information. A lot of people think that it's not legitimate for a game to reward having a good memory. I don't think there's anybody who plays strategy games that would begrudge a game for rewarding someone for superior strat strategic planning, tactical planning. Whatever that is. I don't know what that looks like, necessarily. But I don't think anyone would be like, oh, this game is bad because the, the better strategist always wins. That's a strange nature of comment. But experience is not something we typically want to reward in the same way. It, it's often a knock that 
And, and I, I'm not even sure why. It's often an that if somebody's played Twilight Struggle half a dozen times and playing against a new player, it's like you accept that the new player is not going to win. We reward experience in lots of other things. Anyway, just something interesting I wanted to flag. Another game that I would put in the same category as Twilight Struggle of needing to know the deck and needing to know what, what's going to come up is Blue Moon, which is one of my favorite games. Blue Moon has a salient advantage, though, in that you can play much faster. And so the first time through the deck, you don't know what resources you need to husband and be careful about, and you don't know what your opponent can throw at you. But the first game is only going to take about 20 minutes. And so after that, you immediately start getting some of that good feedback. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. They are very unforgiving for new players. And I don't really know, other than those occasions when you can just give very simple, simple heuristics, I don't know of ways to make it more accessible for new people other than to tell them, this is a learning experience. Prepare to get thrashed. And I'm going to put Quartermaster General games in the same sort of category. There's some you know far out cards in there. Cards that are going to change the whole game state. If you don't know they're coming and you don't prepare for it, then it's it's going to really handicap you. Absolutely. So then there's games where you can give the entire deck composition in five seconds. And you absolutely have to. I, want to, I just talked about Hanabi, uh, having played it again uh, for the first time in a while. Hanabi, you absolutely need to know the distribution of the values. But you can do that in five seconds. The trick is, though, and this is just an interesting sort of uh, observation I have. If you compare a Hanabi to a game like Bargain Hunter, Bargain Hunter, you just tell people the, the, the composition of a deck because you have to in a trick-taking game. People need to know what the what the composition of a custom deck is. You tell them there's six, six different colors, one to nine, each card represented twice. That's it. You're done. Hanabi, you say there are five colors. They go from one to five. There are three ones, two of everything except the five. There's only one of the five, which is almost as simple, but you're going to have to repeat several times to new players. I find that difference fascinating. Just a slight increase in complexity of the deck composition makes it considerably more opaque to new players and you're going to need to repeat it over and over. And that's one of the reasons why I like Bargain Hunter more than other kinds of custom trick taking games like Mu, where the, the composition is, well, there are, th- there are more sevens, and then there's uh, some number of eights, and then there's a weird number of nines. It's, uh, I, it's just one more thing you need to track in the Nib 2 system. But any custom trick trick-taking game, you need to know the deck. Games like Hanabi, you need to know the deck. But at least it's simple, and so you can just repeat it as often as needed. True. Then there's these games that have these, you know, one or two cards that really throw off the whole game, right? Absolutely. And my example is going to be Twilight Imperium 4. There's this action deck that everyone draws from. It's fairly large, not so big as it used to be. And some of these cards are going to come up that are going to, you know, completely change the game or completely hamper your progress i.e. it's like oh i'm going to war sons are these giant death stars that you're going to build and you might DM. you might dedicate your entire uh game into building these right you have to get the tech you have to like six different stages of tech and then you have to save all the money and you know round round 10 he's like finally oh i'm gonna build a war sun here i come and then the, at the end of that actual turn there's like oh here's a law Everyone can build War Suns for free now. You've just wasted your whole game. And there are several cards in this TI4 deck that, that do the same kind of thing. Like, oh, you've built you've built uh, uh, space stations. No, now they're just destroyed because I happen to get this one card. Or you've built, you know, planetary defense systems. No, I'm just going to remove them now and your, you know, your entire turn is wasted. And if you don't know that these cards are in the deck, it's this surprise element, right? It's not so bad. If you know the card is there, if you know that there's a chance that someone might draw it, then it totally hampers, not completely, but, you know, at least it's not this huge surprise. Like, what? You really, you know, you know, well, I knew it was there. There was a chance that you might get it, you know. So at least if you warn the people that this might happen, it's not so bad. It's definitely a negative player experience to, to be hit so hard by a card they didn't know was coming like that. But here, here's just a sincere question, though. And this is this is one of the, the ways in which TI4 is not designed for my preferences. This is not me slagging the design. That's a separate topic. If you know that there's a card that just says... War Suns for everybody, or a card that says no planetary defense systems for anyone, what do you do? Do you not build any planetary defense systems, or do you not invest in War Suns, or do you not invest in anything because you know that some law might come up that changes everything? Oh, you do, but you just know in the back of your head that it might all be for naught. So this is purely an expectations thing. Exactly. Okay, okay, cool. Fair enough. Yeah, this is the category of what I would call bombs, just those cards you need to know are around. And uh, the one that I remember most distinctly was when I first played Fury of Dracula. And we had cornered Dracula. Dracula was in a corner. We were going to you know, track him down and, and, and finally wipe him out. And then I remember the Dracula player looking at their hand and saying, huh. And then playing the escape card, which the escape card is basically a giant reset button that, 
that says I get to go wherever I want and all my trails go all my trails go cold. We're starting again from scratch, more or less. I'm oversimplifying, and it's been different in different editions of Fury of Dracula. It was such a negative player experience for everybody. A card like that needs to be flagged in the rule book. Yeah, I think it was it was off that deck where it could be either good cards or bad cards, and you draw off the bottom. I think it was like that a newspaper card. Remember, you flip. It was a newspaper card. We flipped up and said, "Oh, Dracula escapes, and he gets to go wherever he wants and reset his whole track." And it was just like. It's like, really, we've been playing for two hours and we're just doing like a full reset? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the kind of thing, and this, this dovetails with uh, the difficulty of games like this in terms of the rules explanations. Uh, this is also true of even comparatively simpler and sh- shorter games like Root. Root has ambush cards. Root has technologies called Favor of the Whatever, where you can just get wiped out of a whole bunch of clearings. Root is already detail-heavy enough. Root is, is somewhat difficult to explain properly, and it's very easy for me as a rules explainer to just forget to mention to people oh, by the way, there are ambush cards, they might hose you badly. Oh, by the way, there are these technologies called favor of the rabbits, they might kill all your pieces and rabbit clearings. And so I feel kind of bad when they come up and people are not expecting them. And But then there's this question of how many details do you include in the upfront rules explanation? How long can you start going? Well, there's this exception, this, that exception, and all these other things. Uh, you know, it's a judgment call every time. Usually when I explain Root, I try to remember to talk about ambushes, but I don't tend to go through some of the more problematic texts. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I really should. But that's one of the areas of needing to know the deck that I find unfortunate. It puts the rules explainer in an awkward position. Yeah, it just falls into the same category that we always put. Like, is it if it's a core game in your group, Group and you play it multiple times, there really is no problem. But if you're in a group that is continuously cycling new games all the time, this is definitely going to be a problematic issue. Yeah, and again, sometimes it's simple enough and straightforward enough and obvious enough that people need to know. Trick-taking games, Hanabi, Secret Hitler, for example, when you're playing Secret Hitler, everyone at the table needs to know the distribution of policy cards, but it's relatively simple. You can just remember or quickly check the rule book and just remind everybody this is what's there. When it's a single card that tends to come up that completely changes the game state, again, it's relatively easy to try to remember, and I think it's incumbent on the rules explainer to do that. In a game where lots of wild things happen, your cosmic encounters, your root, things like that, you can't make an exhaustive listing of all the wild stuff that could go. Do you need to mention any of it? How much of it do you need to mention? Again, a huge judgment call, and it sometimes leaves me a little bit like I'm in a no-win position as a rules explainer. Either I'm going to leave something out, and people are going to be disappointed when they come up, or I'm just going to bore everybody with a 20-minute explanation about, and then there's this card, and then there's this card, and then there's this card. Blood Rage that you talked about earlier totally falls into the same category. If For new players, if they don't understand some strategies, and they just let all these other cards go, and, the, and someone that does know the deck fully you know, takes all these cards like the Loki strategy or other, you know, cards that they know they're going to get and people don't know what's coming up, they can totally run away with the game. Yes. The only benefit, that is one of the areas actually where I think Blood Rage's drafting works to its favor. Because at the very least, at the start of the game, everyone gets this mitt full of cards and odds are excellent that in the initial handful of cards that you draw, you're going to see some cards that cue, cue you into the fact that there's going to be some weird stuff that's going to be happening. And if you, you know, if you cast your eye on things like Odin's Throne or any of the Loki death cards or things like that, or the cards that give you tons of points for having lots of dead guys, uh, or even just the fact, you know, that you're clued into that by the fact that there's a game mechanism that says you get points for figures dying during a Ragnarok. All these things are ways to prime people to expect the unexpected, and that helps make for, for more positive experiences. But I agree with you 100%. It is impossible to leave people fully equipped for any drafting game, really, the first time they play. That's one of the virtues of games like Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale does a very good job of informing you what is in the deck. This is how many cards there are of this type. And so many of the suits are symmetrical anyway. So you can get people with a relatively decent understanding of the universe of possibilities before they sit down. But Fairy Tale is far more simple than a game of Blood Rage. Yeah, we do the same thing with Rising Sun, right? The decks are very small for the different years, but you definitely pull out, you know, the end scoring ones. You don't, like, surprise people at the end and say, hey, this is, you know, surprise, this is what you're going to score for the whole game. You know, this is what people are going to be building towards. This is what you have to, you know, be wary of, and then off they go into the Phase 3 cards, and then you, you know, wait for them to come up. Absolutely. And then there are, are games where... You know, you might have that concern, but the composition is borderline irrelevant. For example, I'm, I'm just as an example, the Voyages of Marco Polo. You, your end game scoring cards are just going to be two cities. You don't need to know whether there's every combination of two cities available in order to proceed because you just have your mitt full and you just look at the ones you need and, and, and try, go try to, to satisfy that. 
to talk about, you know, what, what was that the German game we played at El Guapo, that McKenna... McKenna's Burgo. McKenna's Burgo. Not right? German, Spanish. Spanish. McKenna's Burgo. Like that game with cards you have no idea what they're going to do. And knowing that deck would be impossible. Yes, but there, that, that, that's an example of, again, the kind of judgment call that I'm forced to make. I do remember flagging when playing McKenna's Burgo. These are the cards that can give you instant win. And I pulled them out and said, look, this, this guy lets you win instantly if you have all the robots. This woman lets you win instantly if you've got a whole bunch of politicians. And so there, again, there's an easy category of big bombs that you can identify right off the top. But yes, past that, do you tell everybody about the Space Pope uh, sex robot Velociraptor combo? No, that's not, you know, that's something that can just emerge from, from gameplay. And Another category of games where I really wish it could be a little bit more transparent is auction games. Auction games are already pretty intimidating for new players because they don't really know how much anything is quote-unquote worth, especially at the beginning. I would read the card game definitely suffers from that. You know, at the beginning of, the, of, the, of each round, you flop out four cards and they look at them and say, well, how good are these cards? And you basically shrug and say, well, I, uh, uh, you have to decide. That's the game. Well, and, it is sort of the game. It's like how, how much people are going to bid on them, you know, you, yeah, that's that's how much they're going to be worth. But then they start asking very pointed questions about what's the pyramid range on these cards? What's yeah. the farmer range? What's the farmer range two rounds from now, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe I should have answers for these questions as a rules explainer, but I never really felt that it was reasonable to give a sort of comprehensive uh, picture of that. Now, maybe a good player aid. A good player aid can make a lot of the difference in a lot of these things. Raw, for example, in the uh, past the first printing, they've all had the tile distributions printed on the board. So you have an exact sense of how many things can come up. Now, that doesn't help you decide how much things are worth, but you at least know the tile distribution. Tile distribution is also super important for games of Tigris and Euphrates. That's something that I always explain to people. There are more red tiles. There are 50-plus red tiles, 36 blue, 32 of black and green. See, I've remembered. And... I really – there, it's it's relatively simple. Again, a, a very simple set of information at the start of the game to give people a sense of what's yeah. going to happen. Core Worlds does the same thing, right? All the end game scoring cards are right on your player sheet. So everything's there right from the beginning. You don't have to go through all – you know, pull out the deck and say these are the cards that are c- going to come out at the end. It's all right there on your sheet. Stuff like that is perfect. Exactly. You can give players the necessary information, the data at the outset. They're still probably going to ask you a whole bunch of questions as a game is coming or you shouldn't answer. Like, how much is this worth? That's a, that's a judgment question. You, you know, it's, it's the job of a player to figure that out. But it is reasonable to wonder, okay, well, I'm bidding on this stuff now. What's the likelihood of a better thing coming out in the next flop? Should I save my money for that? And there, it, it's nice, especially when the game components help you, to be able to tell somebody, look, here's a generalization, an easy generalization I can give you about the values of the things in this deck. So those are our thoughts on needing to know the deck. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. If you liked this episode, tell a friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>